Berkeley Medical School in San Francisco, and finally to Harvard, where he served as a lecturer in clinical psychoanalysis. Dr. Leary, at the age of 39, began experiments with psychedelics, specifically LSD-25. In 1963, Dr. Leary and Richard Alpert were dismissed from Harvard in order to curb the undergraduate interest in LSD. Dr. Leary established, in Mexico, the International Foundation of Internal Freedom, but the Mexican government demanded that he leave the country. He considers the current marijuana laws unjust and a violation of the Constitution, specifically the First Amendment guaranteeing the right of spiritual exploration, the Fifth Amendment guaranteeing immunity of self-incrimination, and the Eighth and Ninth Amendments. At approximately 10 minutes of one, we will have a short break. Those of you who are interested in staying for a question and answer period will please, please move to the front. Microphones will be set up at either side of the ballroom to accommodate those who wish to ask questions. Our only request is that you make your question only a question and not a statement so that as many people can ask Dr. Leary something as possible. And now it is my pleasure to welcome to the university Dr. Timothy Leary. To continue the lecture, also begun in the middle of a sentence, this time at UCLA, Los Angeles, California, United States of America, planet Earth, the year 1967, as time is reckoned in the common era, about a million or perhaps two million years after our species started its game, about two billion years after the genetic code began its game, about five billion years after God began his dance on this planet, well, uh, we know where we are. The uh, chemical I'm about to ingest <laughs> is odorless, tasteless, and colorless. <laughs> it's addictive. <laughs> it can be lethal in large quantities. and it's harder and harder to get in its pure state. <clears throat> I have three things to say to you today. The first is that um, the only point of life is the religious quest. The second uh, is that um, you must act out, express openly what you have learned in your religious experiences. And third, you must detach yourself from the immediate tribal game to find the timeless message within. Three things I have to say to you. First of all, that when your life is over, you look back and you will remember that the only thing that had any point or meaning was your religious experience. By the religious experience, I mean the immediate, direct, ecstatic confrontation with the timeless energies which exist within you and any of your actions which do not center on the religious experience, any of your actions which aren't leading you to get high, to center, are robot 
peripheral and eccentric. The religious search is the process of turning on. You have to turn on. Now after you've turned on, what do you do? You have to express it. You have to live it out. When you've contacted the divine process within, you'll discover to your astonishment that God is not, as you may have been told, a man who lived in the past and died and whose word is now uh, preserved by such um, religious institutions as the Reader's Digest <laughs> or the phenomena of Christmas cards nor the philosophy of Ronald Reagan. The divine process, if it's anything, if it can be described, and of course man describes God at his own risk. But if it is to be described, it's closer to music. The divine process is a rhythm. It's a beat, which continually manifesting itself in sequences, over and over again, repetition. The same thing that's dancing in the stars, the same thing that's dancing inside the cells of your body, the same thing that's dancing inside the nucleus of the atom, the same problems of north, south, east, west, black, dark, invader, intrusion, escalation, water purification that we worry about at the political level. It's happening within every cell in your body. Indeed, every cell in your body is uh, an organization of communication, defense, transportation, corruption, cleanliness, uh, much more complicated than the city of New York. God's rhythm is expressed at every level of energy, and it's always sequence. It's always cycle. It's always doubling back on itself. When you've turned on, you tune in on this beat, and then you have to start dancing. And the rest of your life becomes uh, in tune with the rhythm that you're discovering within. After you turn on, you tune in. And you can't turn on and tune in unless you systematically, gently, aesthetically begin to detach yourself from the immediate tribal game, which is always anthill. And this process of detaching yourself, tuning in, we call drop out. You have to drop out. Now, it may seem eccentric to you that uh, I, a middle-aged man, comes before you and tells you that you have to get religion. I'm a little astonished myself at uh, being here and saying these things. 25 years ago, I was a college undergraduate, meeting as we are today in rooms um, lit by electricity, listening to graying middle-aged men of the culture stand before us uh, with microphones, essentially to uh, present uh, their philosophy of life, really to defend their point of view, to rationalize what they're doing, and uh, with the implication that perhaps some of you would want to, uh, some of us would want to follow the example of this uh, uh, speaker. Now, 25 years ago, when I was a college undergraduate, there was nowhere listed in the um, college catalog the uh, courses uh, that one might take to uh, work into the profession which um, I now belong to. You can look at your college catalog from aeroscience through to xerography in zoology, and you'll find no courses or majors in how to become a full-time searcher after the divine process. And the vocational counselors and the occupational psychologists uh, won't help you either. You won't find uh, my profession listed in the yellow pages of the phone book. Now it's all taped out for you in the college catalog, beloved robots step by step your life any profession you want to choose is there as it was for me if you want to uh, go into politics uh, study history law political science and when you graduate um, join one of the two parties and with a little hard work and uh, luck and an ipan a smile <laughs> Mm 
You may, may get to be mayor or governor. <laughs> Medicine, it's all taped out for you, beloved robots. Uh, Pre-med, medical school, internship, residency, practice. In 15 years, you'll have your Cadillac. Interestingly enough, uh, when I was an undergraduate, and I'm sure it's true uh, here today, if you want to uh, follow the profession of uh, founding a religion, the last place that uh, you'd probably encourage to do this would be in the divinity school. What is my profession? In other times and in other countries today, my profession, which is the searcher of the divine process, goes under the name of guru, alchemist, shaman, psychophysicist, spiritual teacher. Now, my profession has a long and ancient history. It may be the oldest profession around. Uh, it's nothing new. I'm going to mention uh, a few of uh, my predecessors with no implication that I equal them, but uh, just as any young beginner in profession looks to uh, the textbooks and the um, men in his field in the past, uh, so uh, I do the same today. Uh, about a generation ago, two generations ago, there was a man at Harvard who was practicing my profession. Um, he wrote what I think to be the best book ever written by an American psychologist. It's called The Varieties of Religious Experience. Uh, the man I'm talking about is, of course, William James. Now, William James was using a psychedelic drug. In his chapter on the mystic experience in the varieties, as a matter of fact, he describes the effect of nitrous oxide, that's laughing gas, in uh, wilder poetry and enthusiasm than we ever um, used to describe LSD when we were at Harvard. And Professor James at Harvard uh, ran into a little trouble, too. Uh, they were saying, do you know that Professor James is running nitrous oxide parties in the back bay? <laughs> at other times in the past, such men as William Blake, did you know he was a psychologist? Um, Shankara Sharan, the great visionaries and mystics of the Catholic and Protestant Church, the Hasidic thread throughout uh, the Jewish religion, uh, the Sufis of Islam, uh, back uh, to the um, Buddha and Lao Tzu. Their tradition of finding meaning within, of finding some method of turning on, of finding the uh, divine process inside has been going on. It always runs along as a uh, thread in human history uh, underlying the exploits of politicians and soldiers and um, uh, legislators, but it's there. It's the most powerful tradition uh, that men have ever passed on. Um, there's something that most people don't understand about the visionary quest or the psychedelic experience. Uh, it's not just a uh, glorious kick. Interestingly enough, there's just as much lawful regularity in the processes of consciousness which exist at many levels inside your nervous system and your cellular structures as there are in the forms of energy which we see around us. Uh, just as the microscope 300 uh, years ago opened up the possibility for man of bringing into vision uh, lawful, regular sequences of energy which were heretofore invisible, so do the psychedelic drugs today bring into vision and awareness uh, lawful processes, energy transactions which exist within inside the nervous system uh, which are just as real as uh, the 3,000 words in the English language by which most of us define what we call normal reality. And I'm sorry to say that the um, uh, procedures of uh, my profession require just as much hard work, disciplined attention, and regular practice as do the uh, disciplines of physics or chemistry or politics. The psychedelic experience is no shortcut. Uh, there's no instant mysticism. There's no instant psychoanalysis. There's no instant anything. Just as a person who first looked at the microscope uh, could look at it, and uh, uh, he didn't know what it was, so the, uh, the initiate, the per person who takes LSD for the first time, is whirled into a cellular, capillary, tissue, uh, protein, molecule universe that is completely incomprehensible to him. Now, when the microscope was first discovered, someone could look at it and say, uh, Ooh, amazing. 
bugs. Uh, an artist might look at a microscope uh, and say, amazing design, I'll, uh, I'll paint new pictures. The neurotic would look at the microscope and say, ooh, my mother-in-law. <laughs> the guy from the establishment would look in the microscope and say, there's no place for us in, for this in our uh, Bibles or medical tracts. Uh, clearly, this is the work of the devil. Arrest that man. But there's always uh, those few people that look at the microscope and they begin thinking, what is this all about? And they keep looking, they keep looking, they keep looking. They look at a leaf, they look at a snowflake, they look at a raindrop, they look at a drop of blood from a sick person, a drop of blood from a well person, and slowly, painfully, after hundreds of observations and careful record uh, keeping, they begin to uh, detect some lawful regularities here. And they start drawing little designs. And then they call someone else uh, who's not a neurotic or who's not a uh, police from the establishment looking for the devil and say, hey, uh, look at this drop of blood from a sick person. And then look at the drop of blood from a well person. Uh, you catch on? Do you get the point? The science of cytology or of microbiology was hard work. It took constant observation, record keeping, passing on uh, to your fellow man, replication, checking out of observations, and very slowly a science comes into being. Now the science of turning on and tuning in is nothing new to our uh, generation. Every um, generation, every historical era in the past has had its visionary voyagers uh, they've kept their logs, they've passed on their methods, uh, they've passed on their observations, and we can check out the uh, discoveries of the Buddha or Shankarachara or St. John of the Cross, uh, just as a student of physics today can check out Galileo's uh, experiments with inclined planes. Uh, and you know, uh, it happens to work. Uh, the divine process, uh, the genetic code uh, in its many manifestations has been playing this game for two billion years and there are regularities. Uh, human language uh, changes from uh, century to century but uh, the nervous system doesn't really. The processes of energy around us as registered by our sense organs don't really change. The problems of survival on this uh, strange dark uh, planet uh, haven't changed that much in the last hundred thousand years. And these are the uh, messages, ancient and orthodox, which uh, are rediscovered, reinterpreted, and added to by the psychedelic um, voyager today. Now let me tell you something about the process of uh, turning on. You have to have a sacrament. What is a sacrament? A sacrament is something visible and external that you don't worship, but that you use as a key for uh, getting you out of the immediate time, space, tribal game and uh, turning you on to what's inside. Now, as you look back over the, human, the uh, history of human religions and uh, the science of um, consciousness, you will realize after a while that man has used almost every possible technique for turning on. And uh, oddly enough, uh, he's used opposite techniques. It, it, it staggers the imagination to think of something that man at one time or another hasn't used to turn on. Uh, he's used silence and solitude, or he's crowded together in large groups and small rooms uh, to make uh, chants and noises. Uh, he has used uh, sexual renunciation, or he has used the carefully worked out, exquisitely detailed the sacrimonial techniques of tantric uh, Buddhism where uh, your mate is the goddess and uh, making love is the way to uh, turn on to the divine plan. He has used uh, fasting and he has used a uh, careful diet uh, as macrobiotic people do today. Now the sacrament is always seen as dangerous. And let's uh, not cut corners here. Any sacrament which works is dangerous in two ways. In the first place, it flips you out of your mind. It flips you out of the space-time coordinates of uh, Westwood in 1967. And if it doesn't do that, beloved robots, it's not working. You have to go out of your mind uh, to come to your senses, to use your head, to re resurrect your body, and to uh, travel back in the 
soft time machinery, uh, which is uh, your tissue and cellular um, apparatus. But the real danger of a sacrament which works is its danger to the current establishment. If the sacrament works, it throws into different perspective the um, rituals and the orthodoxy and the structure of the time. Now, over and over again, we've seen this operate in human history. Uh, the Buddha, 2,500 years ago, tried all the methods. After he dropped out of the palace, he wandered around, he fasted, flagellated himself, studied the Vedas. None of them worked because uh, they'd been made too institutional. He sat down under the tree. You might call uh, his turn-on technique the first sit-in. And he said, I'm going to stay here until I make it. Um, about 500 years ago or so, um, a man named Martin Luther looked at the uh, current establishment. You know, and at that time they said, in order to find God, um, it's, uh, you have to get a lawyer. It's all in this book, but the lawyers are the only ones who can have this book. Uh, and you have to pay the lawyer uh, fees, which were called penances and indulgences, and uh, he'll make it for you. It didn't make any sense to Luther, and he said, oh, uh, we've got to drop out of that. Uh, he looked around for a new sacramental method. Uh, the sacramental method is always a new technological device. Uh, the first time the fellow uh, ran down and got a reed and blew through it to reproduce breathing, or took a skin uh, and put it over a, uh, a log and reproduced the heartbeat, the pulse of the universe, and he turned him on that way. It's always a new technological device, which is seen as unnatural by society. In the case of Martin Luther, the thing that made his, uh, his uh, religion go was a very dangerous device, uh, the printing press. You see, the printing press really pulled the uh, rug out of the um, establishment because the printing press meant that you could print the Bible in large quantities. That meant, you mean, Martin, you're saying that any layman in his house can uh, have this uh, sacred thing and without uh, the, the cardinals and the establishment, uh, he can confront God by himself? Yeah, Martin Luther said, that's exactly it. It's uh, you standing there naked with your turn on instrument, uh, the Bible, and making it. But, but Martin, if God had intended that man uses an artificial technique like a printing Bible, uh, he would have uh, made man that way. <laughs> now, another thing about your sacrament is if it turns you on, it confuses you. It's got to confuse you because uh, you're just not prepared by the tribal dialect for what you're going to discover. Unfortunately, I must announce to you, robots, that uh, God doesn't speak English. He's been speaking English for about uh, four or five hundred years. Before that, he spoke uh, Latin. Before that, Greek, then Sanskrit. Uh, the facts of the matter is I read my cellular uh, scripture. Uh, God's been talking cellular and molecular for uh, hundreds of millions of years. And uh, the biochemical phenomena is the key to deciphering uh, what uh, the divine process hath writ. And remember, there's that regularity. You have to have maps, you have to have manuals, you have to have a guide, you have to be planned. Otherwise, you'll be very confused. And it's hard work, it's repetition, it's keeping your uh, attention over and over again on this uh, ancient voyage. Now, uh, I want to give you a, um, uh, a little illustration of this. The first time that I was ever turned on um, biochemically, um, was by my father at the age of uh, seven or eight. Um, my father was a dentist. I had a toothache. I went to his office and uh, he decided to take it out. And I remember he put that rubber mask over my mouth. And I saw his hand on the dial. And then, uh, zoom! I was at another level of consciousness. I don't remember too much about it except I laughed a lot. I can speculate now as to what I was laughing about. But then uh, I could see his hand on the dial, he took me down, and I left his office and went to school and so forth. Um, many years later, about two years ago, as a matter of fact, uh, I was about to go to India, where I was going to spend six months studying with some uh, world-famous uh, members of my profession, including Lama Anagarika Govinda, the, uh, the Lama's Buddhist scholar. And uh, I, didn't, I, I needed some fillings in my teeth. I didn't want to have a toothache on the banks of the Ganges. So um, I started going to a dentist in Poughkeepsie, New York, which is about 15 miles away from where I live. 
and uh, I went 13 or 14 times, and um, the uh, dentist used a uh, consciousness contracting drug. Every time I went, he'd shoot me up with Novocaine. Now, uh, like booze, or like uh, the uh, opiate derivatives, uh, uh, Novocaine is a consciousness contracting drug. It narrows attention down. You don't feel uh, what's there. Uh, the psychedelic drugs, uh, marijuana, LSD, peyote, uh, open you up, uh, they go in the opposite direction, you're much too aware of uh, sometimes what's going on. So that I had uh, several sessions uh, with the dentist, and uh, I had to go back one more time um, to have some scraping and cleaning. But before I went, Dr. Ralph Metzner, who has worked with us for about seven years, he's a Harvard psychopharmacologist, had a terrible toothache, and he rushed to the dentist, and it turned out he had a wisdom tooth impacted, and uh, it was a complicated operation, and the dentist used gas. And I'll never forget that afternoon when uh, Dr. Metzner came back to our center at Millbrook and he walked in. Now, Dr. Metzner had taken LSD about 100 times. He was the editor of the Psychedelic Review. Uh, he knew his way around the consciousness uh, expansion territory, but he walked in and he fell down on the couch and he said, wow, <laughs> forget about LSD. <laughs> so um, the next day I had to go to the dentist. Uh, <laughs> and I sat in the chair. And I, uh, the dentist said, well, uh, we're just going to do a little scraping. I won't use any Novocaine today. I said, uh, doctor, uh, uh, how about some gas? <laughs> yeah, well, don't be silly. Uh, they're going to hurt us. Well, uh, Dr. Metzner got to have gas. And <laughs> so uh, he was humoring me. So uh, he put the um, rubber mask over my mouth, and I could see his hand uh, had a lot of black hair on it. <laughs> and uh, he turned the dial, and then rum. I was at another level of consciousness. Now, the point of this story is that uh, the nervous system, the 13 billion cells in your brain, not to mention the uh, intracellular protein ladder of memory, is highly structured. Uh, it's not accidental. There are absolute lawful regularities there. Your nervous system is uh, somewhat of the proportions of the galaxies that surround us. Your normal mind, uh, with its 3,000 uh, labels, uh, everything you think of as normal reality is to the rest of your brain uh, as the planet Earth is to all these galaxies that surround us. And when you take a trip, you are going out of your mind, off this planet, uh, into an uh, endless sequence of uh, galactic possibilities, which have their own regularities. So, zoom, in the dentist's office in Poughkeepsie, I went out of my mind, and where did I go? I went right back to the dentist chair at the age of seven or eight. And I began to laugh. And I realized that everything that had happened in the ensuing years that I thought was reality was a dream. Because real reality was this particular cluster of neurons uh, in one of these galactic uh, interstellar spaces in my own nervous system. When you're there, that's reality. Uh, when you take a psychedelic drug and you're in your uh, soft membrane of your ear, reality is sound waves. Uh, if you take LSD and you're into your eye, reality is this thunderous beat of uh, light bounding off objects at the speed of 186,000 miles a second. And these soft flower petal uh, mosaic swamps of uh, millions of uh, rods and cones. So there I was. I was home again, and everything that happened between these two dental chair operations was a dream. But what an incredible dream! The detail! Um, I went to uh, high school, and I went to college, and I went to the World War, and I got my doctorate. Incredible, the detail. And uh, then I uh, went to Harvard, and I left Harvard. Mm. <laughs> um, and I, I felt chagrined, uh, like how seriously I took it. I got angry, and I was jealous, and I was competitive, and I was depressed. But yet, how poignant that I did care that the dream was so uh, involved uh, that uh, I, I did cry, I did laugh, and I did triumph, and I did make love, and I did get jealous. Uh, well, if that's the way uh, God uh, designed it, uh, what can I do? There was one fleeting moment when I thought I could jump out of the dentist chair and I could run down the street shouting, get me home, get me home, get me back to Millbrook, or I'm Timothy Leary. Then that seemed kind of untidy to have that dental napkin around. <laughs> and um, I knew that, that, that he, would probably, obviously, he knew more than I did, and he could get me back. 
I said, all right, I never thought that it, the revelation would come this way with black hair in his hand. But the beauty, the grandeur, the detailed um, exquisiteness of that was such that um, I'm ready to go back, Doc. Thy will be done. And then I uh, see his hand in the dial again, and he took the mask off, and I looked up at him, and I said, Phew, you know, how long has this been going on? He said, what? He said, well, I just had, well, it was to me a deep religious experience. It, it challenged the essence of my paranoia and of my faith, and I saw the whole thing in a different perspective, and he said, oh, well, yeah, I said, uh, we give gas. Uh, people have nightmares and dreams. They see animals. That's nothing. And, you see, the dentist couldn't afford to have people having religious experiences in his office. <laughs> or they'd take his union card away, right? Uh, what time is it? Yeah. Uh, the point of that story, and it's an ancient story, the uh, Chinese Taoist philosopher Chancer said many uh, centuries ago that he had a dream that he was a butterfly, and after that dream he was never sure whether he was a Chinese philosopher who uh, dreamt he was a butterfly, or a butterfly who uh, <laughs> talked philosophy. Because the, the terror of the situation, the terror of the neurological, ontological energy situation that we're flung into is that uh, there are as many levels of reality as there are energy systems around us and structures and soft machines to decode this energy. Uh, that's both the uh, terror and the glory of the human philosophic or religious situation. Uh, turning on is not easy play because the, the, the problem with uh, our current sacraments, which are biochemicals known as psychedelic, the problem is they work. You better be prepared to go out of your mind. Does it come as any surprise that our sacrament today is chemical? We've used the wonders of modern chemistry uh, to do everything to make our lives more comfortable and to titillate ourselves with every form of uh, amusement, like television. We've used modern chemistry to uh, move us faster and faster and faster. I don't know where. We've used the wonders of modern chemistry to keep us healthy, and we've used the wonders of modern chemistry in the most amazing uh, ways of turning ourselves off through tranquilizers, barbiturates, and booze. Does it come as any surprise that we're finally getting around to using the wonders of modern chemistry to do that only meaningful thing in life to find the divine process within, to turn on to the real meaning. Now after you've turned on, you have to tune in. You have to express the glory or the horror or the confusion or the clarity uh, in some acts of beauty or of expression. You have to start dancing to the beat that you've uh, turned on to. Um, it's no accident that we have psychedelic art today. If you look back, and it's what we're going through has been, you know, it's, it's been going on over and over again, the same cycle, drop out, turn on, tune in, structure, drop out, turn on, tune in, drop out, turn on, tune in, drop out, turn on, you know, it, uh, the, the phenomenon of psychedelic art is one of the uh, oldest uh, symptoms of the, um, of the process. Every group who has stumbled onto a new sacrament uh, gets this revelation and they rush back to the tribe and they put on the uh, walls of the cave with the berries or they uh, uh, scratch out in the sand or they uh, get some new way to, 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 to express it. You've got to express it, uh, mainly for yourself so you can remember it, so you can reconfirm it, but then of course to turn on other people as well. And then you build Shart Cathedral, then you build the Taj Mahal, you weave a Persian rug. You've got to express it somehow, because that beat, you know, it's the old basic deep rhythm. You've, you've got to start tuning into it. And of course, you're always successful. If you've really been turned on, because uh, mo most of mankind is caught, imprinted in the tribal game. And when someone staggers back from the mountain, or from the desert, or from the lifeboat, or from wherever it was, and they, 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 they start, this is how it is, this is how I saw it, it, it unfailingly communicates because the turned-on guy who's tuning in 
to your sense organs. He's tuning into your uh, soft uh, membranes. He's tuning into your cellular beat. He's tuning into your heart. It's no accident that the new art always takes on. It's no accident today that, I, like, can you name me uh, one internationally famous rock and roll band that isn't, doesn't have in its repertoire a hymn or an ode uh, to uh, psychedelic drugs? Uh, this is part of the, the historical process. Um, we are here in Los Angeles uh, this week to uh, tune in. We're presenting at Santa Monica Thursday and Saturday night our psychedelic celebration. Uh, we're using psychedelic art to uh, reproduce and induce a psychedelic experience to show what a trip is like. Now we've got ourselves, uh, we turned on and uh, we're tuning in and we got ourselves caught. Uh, I'm caught right now in show business. Uh, you know, I, I, I can't stop. Uh, we uh, owe so much money uh, to the uh, um, agents and to the, uh, you know, the, the uh, unions and the ushers and so forth. We, we, we've been caught in this, um, this, uh, this process. We have recapitulated in the last few years, in a very small, trivial way, the history of Christianity. Uh, we're trapped with our big uh, cathedrals and mortgages, and um, uh, I'm dropping out. Uh, this is the last time uh, you're going to see me in this role, or this is the last time you're going to see our psychedelic celebrations uh, in this form, because uh, we, uh, you got to keep, it's a process that's cyclical. You turn on, then you tune in and you get your structure, you weave your oriental rugs, and then you're in danger of selling them, right? Uh, and then when you get to that, you've got to drop out again. Turn on, tune in, drop out. Now, I want to end um, by... Um, in the next just 10 minutes by uh, talking about dropping out. And to do this, I'm going to drop out uh, right in front of you. Uh, I've been talking uh, the professor uh, game, and I have the professor uniform on. Uh, now, you've listened to many people talk to you with uh, microphones and electric lights and uh, with shoes and ties. Um, I want, let's all drop out of the, uh, this 20th century game. You know, people have only been talking with microphones and electricity for about 50 years. You know that? You know, like we think it's the only way uh, to pass on uh, the message, and it's not. Uh, for thousands of years, for tens of thousands of years, for hundreds of thousands of years, uh, men have been uh, sitting down uh, by uh, candlelight. Would you turn the lights off? Um, and um, barefoot to talk about uh, what's what. Yeah. I am uh, taking off my shoes and socks. <laughs> now this may appear eccentric, <laughs> but for thousands of years, men who have cared about what it's all about have been sitting on the floor in front of natural light with bare feet, talking the way I am now. It's the most ancient method of communication. It's uh, sliding a little bit out of um, the 20th century electronic, electric atmosphere. And the message I'm going to pass on is the oldest message of all. Beloved robots, you've got to drop out. Now, I'll give you a little of my own personal history to illustrate uh, this point. I was born a mutant. I was born perfect. I was born a Buddha. Uh, I'm an acid head. I'm a nucleic acid head. I talk to my cells, or I listen to my cells, and my cells tell me that the genetic code inside every cell in my body has been working for two billion years on what we might call improved product design. 
And my DNA code is like a Detroit uh, plant design center. And for two billion years, my DNA code has been sending out uh, consumer research, um, what you call RNA, uh, nucleic acid uh, messengers. How's the climate out there? Oh, a glacier's coming? Yeah, let's grow a little more hair in the next one. <laughs> oh, well, uh, it's uh, snowy out there, so they're eating us up, huh? Well, let's change the color this year to white. Uh, what is she like uh, this millennium? Uh, blue eyes? Okay, a little more blue in the next design. I was born, the DNA code's best answer at the time to the energy system on this planet. I was born a mutant. I was born perfect at the time. And then what happened to me? Well, I fell into the hands of my mother and father. Mom and Dad went to work as quickly and relentlessly as they could to rob me of my Buddhahood and to make me into a good boy. At the age of five or six, my parents did something which my genetic code thinks is quite deplorable. At that tender, susceptible age, they turned me over to some strangers who hung around a primary school pushing addictive drugs. The drugs were tribal symbols and the drug pushers that hung around those primary schools were my teachers. I wonder if the same thing happened to most of you. You know, each one of you was born perfect. The complete two billion year deck of cards was in your hands. You were all born Buddhas. Don't you remember? And what happened? Probably the same thing that happened to me. The tension between the generations, young and old, is the oldest tension in human history, my cells tell me, is particularly difficult today. At no time in human history are two generations farther apart than the people under 25 and the people over 50. Now, I'm here to preach harmony and union. I don't want any of you to rush home and beat up on mom and dad. <laughs> Indeed, I suggest that when you're ready, when you're spiritually ready to do so, go home and turn on mom and dad. <laughs> now, I'm quite serious about this. You see, this is the ancient, ancient setup. Young versus the old. You've got to drop out of the old man's game. For thousands and thousands of years, aged and probably impotent men, east and west, have been sending young seed-carrying men out to kill each other. Why? To defend the chess pieces of status and external power that go along with menopausal mentality. <laughs> when, you see, we were all born turned on. We were all born completely hooked up to the whole process. 13 billion cells, all radiating in tune with each other and what's going on outside. And we've been robbed step by step by step of this internal power. Men seek external power when they've lost the internal power. Men who are sad, sad, sickness, age, death, begin to grab on the outside. And don't kid yourselves, beloved young robots, for thousands and thousands of years, aged and probably impotent men in the East and West Athens and Sparta, you know, uh, Persia and uh, Athens, uh, France and England. For thousands of years, these aged men have been fingering the lovely long tube of power which has just been given them. It was the spear, it was the sword, it was the long blow, those lovely cylinders of external power. 
Now, come on. Are you going to fall for this? You've got to drop out. Now, by dropping out, I don't mean any acts of rebellion. Don't vote. Don't picket. Don't protest. No visible sign. Because anything you do in the way of overt political activity is playing the game. It's playing the power game. Dropping out means gently, invisibly, beautifully, finding what's inside and expressing it slowly in a cellular fashion around you. Now, there are a lot of misunderstandings about drop out. You say, Timothy, you just can't go in front of high school kids and college kids and tell them to drop out of uh, school. Beloved robots, I've got to. Are you under any illusions about the fact that UCLA is sponsored by taxes paid by menopausal people to make you like them? <laughs> now, another misapprehension here is that dropping out is an escape. People say to me over and again, uh, middle-aged people uh, with a scotch in their hand usually. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, this is all very interesting. I'm sure I'll grant you that you can find God and beauty and wisdom within, but it's an escape with LSD. The real way to do it is to slug it out here with mortgages. You've got to do it through suffering. You've got to, uh, that's the real reality, and there's no way you can avoid that. Beloved robots, that's the big lie. The real addictive narcotic process in this country is the establishment. Now, do you know what addictive narcosis is? I've never taken heroin, but I've talked to a lot of junkies. And they say it goes like this. Uh, you stick the needle in your vein, and then very quickly, you fall into this kind of womb-like, uh, gauzy, cotton, pleasant uh, situation where you, the, the things that go on out there, what's really going on, you don't care about. It's so cozy. It's so cozy, and it's always so pleasant, and all you want to do is to keep it coming. That's the only thing you're concerned with, is to keep this process coming into your vein that makes it so warm and soft and cottony cozy. You good boy, now you're in high school. Yes, now you get a little car. Isn't that nice? Doesn't that feel good? Yeah. Now college, get a bigger car. Now, oh, yes, you're doing fine. Just keep it coming. Doesn't that feel good? There's nothing to worry about. There you go. Now you're a junior executive. Oh, yeah. Now, you get a nice car, yeah, get a nice split-level house, isn't that good now? And look at that television, isn't that great? Now, what do you want? Yeah, oh, you're doing fine now, yeah, you're going to take over the office. Now you get to have that winter in Florida, doesn't that feel good? Isn't that, what's there to worry about? It's going fine, isn't it? Got your insurance paid? Oh, you're doing wonderful, fine, you're all set, yeah. Now we got the senior citizen's house, isn't that beautiful? With wonderful color television, there you go. Wasn't that easy? The real hard thing to do is to drop out. Now, what does dropping out mean? It means you come home one day and you say, I won't play it anymore, George V. I'm sorry, um, LBJ. I won't play it anymore. Um, um, uh, then what do you do? Then you discover you're a two billion year old piece of soft machinery on this strange and rather unfriendly planet. And where do you go from there? You really have to be creative. How are you going to spend the next 40, 50 years? Uh, how are you going to survive uh, with this hostile uh, species around you that are going to eat you up, uh, push you down? What are you going to do? The dropout has to become creative. You have to start uh, right at scratch, barefoot in front of a candle, and you figure out where do we go from here. Dropping out has always been the toughest procedure. Staying in is the easy, addictive way. Now, don't vote. Don't take jobs. Uh, don't belong to political parties. You know, remember back in 1962, uh, we elected a peace candidate? No. Do you think it makes any difference who won, wins the fight in China? In Poland, uh, the Catholic cardinal agrees completely with Gomolko uh, that we've got to keep dresses uh, long and uh, keep people working hard. I mean, menopausal mentality uh, uh, simply quarrels over who's going to run the show. But menopausal mentality wants to pass laws to keep you uh, coming along. 
Now, what are we going to do with this older generation? You see, you young people are just about a minority, a majority now. Well, what are you going to do? Now, obviously, we can't, uh, as the Berkeley radicals want us to do, you know, they've corrupted our motto, turn on, tune in, drop out in Berkeley now. They say, tune in, drop out, and take over. <laughs> now, I'm sorry, this is a m menopausal mentality, and it grieves me to see young people who think they're far out and avant-garde and activists repeating these same old lines about power, student power, got to take over university. Like what would uh, Jerry Rubin or Mayor Salvo do if they became chancellor? Well, the first thing they'd do would be ban LSD. But what are you going to do, you young people, when you start turning on and tuning in and dropping out with this enormous uh, group of 50-year-olds uh, who, uh, who aren't going to give up power? We can't pass laws because we're not into that anymore, are we? The way it operates, the way anything that lives and grows operates, my cells tell me, is in the cellular fashion. We all start as a single cell. You have to do it yourself. Then find two or three friends. Then you've got the beginnings of a tribe. We're all primates. We're all tribal animals. Uh, then very slowly you begin uh, turning on other people. Now what are we going to do about the older generation? I'm quite serious. Uh, the young people have got to go home and turn on mom and dad. See, here's what you do. Uh, on your next vacation, after you've uh, started this process, you go home. Uh, well, like, who's going to turn on uh, LBJ? See, I'm not going to do it. It's going to be Linda Bird. <laughs> uh, that, that may sound far out, but statistics, uh, Time Magazine says that 20% of college students today are using marijuana LSD. That's that last uh, time issue on youth. Of course, uh, the percentage of, uh, of youngsters who are using LSD and marijuana is, uh, are centered in the better colleges. It's the Ivy League colleges, it's the California College, the University of Chicago. Uh, there are very few uh, problems with pot in Mississippi State Teachers College. <laughs> We're bourbon drinkers, huh? <laughs> so that means that the people who are running this country today with their menopausal mentalities of escalation, de-escalation, credibility gaps, and so forth, <laughs> the one thing that they've got going for them are their kids. And their kids, where they kids go to school? They went to, they went to school at Harvard, right? They went to school at UCLA, didn't uh, you, uh, Linda Bird? So the dialogue's got to be, uh, sooner or later you're going to have to come home and you're going to have to sit down in your uh, living room with Dad. Uh, Hello, Daddy Bird. <laughs> um, son, would you like to have a drink? No, Dad. Um, I don't think I'll have a drink right now. Um, Dad? Um, don't you think you've done enough? <laughs> Don't you think you've worked hard enough now? You, 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 you ran for the Senate 30 years ago, Dad. You've been, you've been, don't you think you should rest, Dad? Uh, why, uh, why don't you... Uh, uh, Daddy Bird, wh why don't you uh, just retire now and spend the 10 years left finding God? Come to your senses. Learn to use your eyes and your ears. Uh, run barefoot on the beach. Uh, can you do that? Uh, now we're going to have to take away all your toys. UCLA students, we cannot let the menopausal mentality vote. Nobody over 50 should be allowed to vote. <laughs> they shouldn't be allowed to have power. They shouldn't be allowed to have cars hurling around. What's a 60-year-old lady doing in a car? <laughs> she should be sitting somewhere out in the, in the meadow, uh, uh, <laughs> smoking marijuana. <laughs> now, as you, uh, you've got to start your own religions. You've got to get a few friends together and uh, figure out what life is all about and uh, write down your little chart. In the state of New York, to start a new religion, it takes six people, a hundred bucks, and a lawyer. A hundred bucks is for the lawyer. <laughs> you got to get six people to sit down with you and uh, lay their blue chips on the line and figure out on paper uh, what you think life is all about, how you're going to find meaning, how you're going to turn on to the divine rev revelation. Use any sacrament you want. Use any ritual you want. Don't borrow the rituals from anyone else. Uh, the thought that young people would be using in their religions the particular rituals and jargon that we use in our small religion it would shock me. Uh, you've got to start your own religion. Now, after you do this, you're going to be in a little trouble with Caesar. This is the ancient dialogue. 
what belongs to Caesar and what belongs to God. I'm going to give you a simple formula for protecting your spiritual quest. Anything that moves out there on the highways, the waterways, the airways, the automobiles, the airplanes, the banks, the weapons, the land, anything out there, that belongs to Caesar. He's controlling that with guns. If you don't like the particular Caesar, vote him out of office or throw him out of office. That's been done for years. But it has nothing to do with the real spiritual meaning of life, which takes place inside the kingdom of heaven. Now, where is the kingdom of heaven? The kingdom of heaven is your body. The gates to Eden are your sense organs, and the boundaries of uh, heaven is your skin. You remember what the man said? Seek ye the kingdom of heaven, it's within you. Now, he didn't mean that metaphorically. <laughs> Beloved Robes, he meant that literally. Within you, inside your body, is the kingdom of heaven. No one has the right to tell you what you do inside your own body. Why? Because inside your own body, you are God. Inside my body, I'm God. I can change the levels. I can change the climate. I can change the whole procedures only inside my body. Now, because I'm doing this and I'm God with inside my own body, that gives me no right to rush out in the freeway and stop the cars and say, I'm the new Messiah, folks. Because uh -uh. the uh, freeway belongs to Caesar. And my divinity ends exactly where it begins, at the ends of my sense organs and my skin. Now, what touches the delicate flowers of my eyes or what vibrates against my eardrum and filters through the soft, liquid-filled canals of my ear? Who and what touches my skin is God's business, mine. What I introduce in my body, sexually or chemically, is my business and nobody else's. <laughs> now, at present time in the United States, there are lots of laws telling you the color of the person you can introduce in your body. That's called miscegenation laws. They are profane and they're irreligious and they've got to be disregarded. There are lots of laws today in the United States uh, governing what you can put inside your body to change your consciousness. These laws are atheistic and violations of the sanctity of the human body. Now, Big Brother in Athens, Rome, Washington, FDA, FBI, public health, he's always interested in our welfare, right? He can say, but we're doing it for your own good. The color of the person that you go to bed with or the kind of chemical you put in your body is our business because we want you to be happy, healthy robots. Sorry, FDA, FBI, Mr. Rome. Uh-uh. Now, what you can do, Mr. FDA in Rome, is this. You can put a label on the package. And you can send uh, FBI, FDA uh, lectures here to lecture to us. Fine. You can put, a uh, put the message, the warning on the package. Even if I want to kill myself, it's my business. Because is there one myth or one religious theological uh, uh, system in human history that didn't allow God to end the universe? whether it's Vishnu taking his divine sleep or the God of the Old Testament thundering it down in fire or uh, just you turning the button off because you're coming back. It's an endless, timeless process. Don't worry about that. If I want to kill myself quickly through cyanide or slowly through camel cigarettes, <laughs> it's my business. Now, Mr. Big Brother in Washington, Rome, can put the label on the package. He can say, warning, cigarette smoking causes lung cancer. Okay? He can put, warning, cyanide causes uh, death through stomach ache. <laughs> he can put, warning, LSD causes death rebirth. He can put, warning, marijuana brings you to your senses. No! <laughs> but what I do within is my business. Now, if the things I put in me lead me to rush around outside disturbing Caesar's order, arrest me. If the things I put in my body cause me to be untidy or to break laws out there, I have no defense. There are plenty of laws to protect public decorum and uh, highway, byway safety. 
Those are Caesar's laws, fine. But in the sanctity of my own home, with my family and my co-religionists, in front of our shrines, smoking marijuana or camel cigarettes, or even if we want to be as reckless as to drink some booze now and then, that's our business. Now one final word of warning. As you turn on, tune in, and drop out, you're going to discover that you're a mutant, that you're perfect, that you're God, because you are. But be careful. If you rush home and uh, say, uh, well, Daddy Bird, I'm God, your father's going to say, Mother, come here. And he says, yes, uh, call the doctor. Yes, he said, he's come home from UCLA and he says he's God. <laughs> You're likely to f- end up in a psychiatrist's office or worse if you go around announcing your two billion year old divinity, which is an ironic commentary on the atheism and external addiction of our culture. At other times, and indeed, in most places in the world today, like India in the East, if a man comes down to the marketplace and comes home and says, hey, I'm God, you know, his family says, well, I'm glad, glad you caught on. Uh, he always was a slow learner. <laughs> Matter of fact, the uh, standard form of greeting in India today is this. Namaste. Namaste, I salute the God within you. And then walk down in the middle of a sentence to the next lecture. We'll take about a five minute break for those of you who are going to move around. Uh, There will be time to ask questions. There will be microphones set up at the side. Give us a chance to get ready. We'll be ready to go in about five minutes. When people say to me, LSD is artificial, does he mean a, a, a hundred billion year old, a million year old drug is artificial? Uh, uh, when they say LSD is an escape, when they say LSD is a crutch, I'm being taken into their chessboard of concepts in which psychological crutch uh, seems to be uh, a meaningful concept, which it isn't to me. So I'm, I'm trying to put myself on the chessboard of someone who has this piece which says uh, LSD can be a psychological crutch. And then I have to ask, well, what do you mean by psychological crutch? What is not a psychological crutch? Is a study at UCLA a psychological crutch? Is um, our book a psychological crutch? Uh, is any sacrament a psychological crutch? Uh, is, any, is anything, anything you do out there a psychological crutch? See, from the standpoint of your real Buddhist, your person who's really centered, uh, from the standpoint of someone like Krishnamurti, anything you do is a crutch. That the only thing you have to do is just be centered, gyroscopically uh, in tune in every second, to the millions of things that are going on around you. And then, of course, from that standpoint, LSD is a psychological crutch. You see the is a psychological crutch. Clothing is a psychological crutch. Um, I have to ask, to inquire, what level you're asking this question. Is LSD psycho... Uh, see, the psychiatrist will say, well, we, we grant that marijuana and uh, LSD are not uh, physically addictive, like booze and uh, camel cigarettes, but they're psychologically addictive. People can get dependent psychologically on marijuana and LSD. And sure, that's possible. Uh, uh, There are many people whose uh, uh, games become centered around the whole uh, (laughs) cops and robbers thing of being a pot smoker. Or uh, we already have, uh, as every religion has, uh, LSD one-upmanship. The uh, person whose psychological crutch is, I've taken LSD more, I've taken more LSD, or, you know, so that uh, anything, (laughs) any form of energy, uh, any word can be used as a psychological crutch. And to that extent, LSD can be a psychological crutch. The point of the psychedelic uh, quest, remember, I I, I started this uh, lecture at the beginning of a, in the middle of a sentence, 
Uh, your life began in the middle of a sentence. Uh, the genetic code is always spinning things out in the middle of a sentence. Uh, it's the continual process of turn on, tune in, drop out, turn on, tune in, drop out. As soon as LSD becomes a psychological crutch to you, take LSD. <laughs> the crutch will be gone. Uh, yes, I was wondering what you, uh, when you say when the term dropping out, I want to ask you why you are in, if you were going to drop out, why are you so involved in the game right now, in the process of making money and going to nightclubs and performing your psychedelic rituals? I also want to ask you why... Wait, let's ask that and then let me, uh, okay. and then I'll give you a second question. Um, like I don't perform in nightclubs. <laughs> Uh, not that I have anything, uh, I, I think that a religious service could be held in the nightclub. Uh, the new religion always starts, you see, with those three groups, the young, the creative uh, artists who are dissatisfied with society, and with the minority groups of color. The Christian religion, you know, uh, didn't start in uh, Canterbury Cathedral. It started in those low-down, offbeat, galley slave uh, meeting places. It's, the re new religion always starts in the Lower East Side. Uh, now then, uh, as far as making money, uh, I, I, I wish that were true. Uh, the reason, that, as I say, that we're continuing this one uh, cycle of celebrations that we contractually agreed to is uh, uh, so that we will uh, uh, break even. We're, uh, we're a nonprofit uh, organization, and uh, no personal monies are made. Now, why do I do this at all? Uh, frankly, it was a mistake. Uh, we got led step by step into this uh, uh, large hall uh, where you advertise and you have to have a publicity in order to fill it. That was a terrible mistake, and we'll never do that again. We, it happened. The way that happened was that we had been working on psychedelic art techniques at Millbrook, and we were running summer sessions, and we uh, were, were becoming more and more effective because, believe it or not, um, we're God intoxicated. You've got a tough minority group in your hands on us because. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to us, uh, we, we, we're in, in touch with the divine presence. So we developed this psychedelic art, which really was working. And then we said, well, we'll take it down to New York City and turn on some other people there. And uh, we couldn't get a small theater, and we got into a large theater, and the most terrible thing happened to us. We became successful. And Variety had uh, headlines, Doc Larry grosses 10000 a week. And uh, the, the critics uh, uptown, Broadway, came down and said, ooh, it's a new Andy Warhol type of happening. Everyone's got to see it. And uh, <laughs> then, uh, uh, you know, uh, they said, come on, build a big cathedral now. So many people want to get to Chart. You know, come on, you've got to build a big temple for all those people in Delhi. But and of course, and then you've got to have to get the lumber and the ivory and so forth. Oh, now, now you started this. The, your next celebration has got to be because thousands of people want to see it. So then you've got to spend more money for it. It was all a mistake. We're sorry we did it. We've learned from it, and we're dropping out. As I say, this is the last time, this particular tour is the last time you'll ever have the opportunity to see our Taj Mahal Canterbury Cathedral because we're dropping out of it. Now, you had a second question. I want to know, uh, do you think that you could attain the, uh, the place where you are now without any education? You said that you were born a Buddha and then your parents deformed you, so <laughs> to speak. And I was wondering if you are condemning your education and telling us to drop out of school so that we can't reach the state that you're in, in our own selves. Oh, listen. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, of course, take everything I say with a grain of salt. Uh, Nobody really knows. Uh, don't listen to whatever anyone tells you to do about putting who or what you put into yourself. Uh, be very skeptical. Uh, but I feel sincerely that um, because I was thrown into the hands of primary school teachers who were complete strangers to my parents, I was an anonymous little robot. That's five or six years old, my busted brown collar. They put me into the hands of the most, the complete strangers. They didn't know who that first grade teacher was with all of her fierce commitment to make me a good boy and to make me into a good little robot. Yes, I feel that uh, the educational process I went through uh, lost me about 30 years. And if someone had told me, uh, as we, the psychedelic um, 
religionists are telling our kids, uh, don't do that, don't go through that. Uh, every symbol that you learn, see you're hooking up, uh, it's a neurological loop in your, uh, your nervous system, every symbol is a weight, and every one of these symbolic connections, red, white, blue, two times two is four, you think that's great, but you're also, uh, these become heavy molasses, conditioned reflex uh, chess pieces. It's very hard to break out of two times two is four, red, white, and uh, joy. Oh, joy, no, red, white, and blue. So you, um, uh, be very careful. <laughs> be very, very careful of what symbol connections you put in your uh, nervous system because your teachers literally are training you to be symbol junkies. Every time uh, we teach our kids anything, we teach them the way out of the symbol. Don't ever teach anyone a symbol that you don't have the antidote for. Uh, and I, I must sincerely answer your question, yes, I regret very well, it's my karma, uh, but uh, our kids are taught what I'm telling you uh, at our center at Millbrook and in our religion, which numbers about 360 people, we can't let it go beyond 360 because it's a nice round number. And how can you possibly have a religion of more than three or 400 people? How can you possibly turn on and share the divine process with more than three or 400 people? Uh, so how can you possibly have in your religion more than that? But the people in our religion have children. We have 15 children that live at Millbrook right now. Every one of those kids over the age of six has uh, had a psychedelic drug experience and is taking psychedelic drugs as regularly as Catholic children go to uh, confession and communion. These kids are being taught what we believe, that education is a narcotic addictive process which will make an anthill robot out of you. And uh, we may be wrong, take what I'm saying with great skepticism, but we are living consistently by what we have learned in our psychedelic experiences. We're passing it on to our kids, and our kids at seven, eight, and nine are making discoveries about the nature of reality uh, that it took the Western civilization about 2,000 years, Immanuel Kant, to work out. And we may be wrong. Uh, we're a social experiment, as any new tribe is, as any little band of mutants are. And that's how we see ourselves, living in a feudal society where we pay feudal dues to uh, Baron Rockefeller of New York and uh, to the king in Washington. We're living by our wits, as tribes have always done in feudal societies. Uh, we're an experiment. We may be all eccentric. Uh, don't follow our, our method, but uh, listen to us and watch because we think we're in tune with the basic tribal, primate, cellular uh, beat, tempo of uh, God, and uh, we may uh, have a way of go life going that may save us all from uh, becoming a planetary, air-conditioned, freewayed, blonde, tanned, crew-cut race of robots. <laughs> you say that the process of uh, turning on, tuning in, and dropping out uh, is eternally cyclic or repetitive. Don't you feel that there's a way out of that process? I mean that with the Buddha, uh, LSD and things like that are like a raft across the river. Once you cross the river, you leave the raft there, you found the end. Is there an end to your quest? Yes, that's uh, the highest level question. I'm asked hundreds of questions a week, and that's the highest level question I'm ever asked. And uh, I hope that in every audience someone that asks that question. Um, uh, see, what he's raising, what, see, uh, all these problems, we're beginning just to, to realize our problems, were being uh, studied 4,000 years ago by the wisest race of men that we have any history of. These are the Vedantic Veda philosophers in India 4,000 years ago. They were studying reality and what's life about at a higher level than the West has ever uh, reached. Now the question he has just asked is, uh, it's a Buddhist question. The Buddha says that uh, beyond the life cycle itself, there is a center uh, where everything is pure, void, harmony, and from which, it's like the solar, lunar, diamond, peacock feather eye of God, which is both everything and nothing at one time. From there, you look out from that center and you see all the evolutions of all the planets. Now, I believe this to be true, because I've been in that center at flashing moments of uh, what men call illumination in the past. From that center, uh, you see the whole business. Uh, now, at that point, you don't need LSD, you don't need words, uh, you don't need anything. The, the, um, uh, my spiritual uh, searchings have not carried me to that high level. 
I hope that I, I see, I'm going to drop out and I'm going to go to the east in about six months and you're not going to hear from me or see me around for at least a year. And I hope during this year that I will learn things by taking LSD once a week uh, and reading no book that is uh, less than a thousand years old. I hope during this year uh, to get to a point where I can give you a better answer to that question. Uh, because I hope that everything I'm saying now will appear to me and to you in two or three years as the babbling of a child, uh, because it is an endless process, which is the miracle and glory of it. Uh, my question is directed to the following problem. Uh, what is illusion and what is reality? Now, some have argued that we <coughs> simply can't get behind our thought models because our thought models are determined by our physiology. Now, do you feel that by, for instance, dropping acid, one can transcend one's own physiology? No, I don't. Uh, uh, LSD is a highly complicated uh, biochemical phenomena, which obviously interacts with uh, uh, the nervous system. Uh, in uh, very powerful ways, and I think does uh, uh, shake up and disturb and open up uh, protein memory molecular uh, chains, uh, which probably are not neurological, but I think are inter intracellular, but you're still uh, within physiology. See, the, you have to accept karma. Karma to an orientalist uh, is the fact that uh, your seed was planted on this particular slope so that your branches and twigs and uh, whole uh, structure was lopsided because of the fact that you were born in the United States in the 20th century with a particular concept because you were born in this kind of a body. If you were born 50, 100,000 years from now, you would look back on us the way we look back on uh, the early cavemen. This, this is all physiological in addition to social, political, and personal karma. Now, I think that uh, we always have to accept the fact that we see the whole process from within this transient uh, physiological uh, instrument. It is possible to get this instrument tuned in to such a point by using sacraments like LSD that you're in touch with cellular, genetic, and even meta-living phenomena. That's my hypothesis that the nervous system can tune itself in, just like a leaf on a tree that can tune itself in on twig, branch, and down a root. It is possible for the human nervous system, even for the human mind, uh, the 20th century UCLA mind, uh, to be flashing in and out of a centeredness that is tuned in on these many different levels of um, molecular and cellular physiological energy. But I don't think else he can get you out of the physiological. Yes. I, I I would you like to know if go you on with that. No. I would like to know if you've noticed any lessening in your ability to verbalize after taking a lot of acid. <laughs> the question is, I think, have I noticed a difference in my uh, pattern of verbalization since I've taken LSD? Well, it's very difficult to. Uh, it's very difficult for me to answer a question about the effect of LSD on, on, on my own personal game. First base, um, I'm an Irishman, and uh, Irishmen are giving to talk a lot in wild, poetic, uh, imaginative fantasies. Uh, also, I'm talking about farther out things, and when I talk to an audience today, I'm aware of the fact that I'm just not trying to talk to two levels of consciousness, symbol awareness, as I used to when I was a professor, and to keep you from slipping into another level of consciousness, stupor. <laughs> Many, I'm talking to audiences now in which maybe, uh, maybe 50 of you are uh, at a higher level of consciousness right now than I'm, I am. Any of you have had a martini uh, to drink uh, today are at a lower level, but maybe some of you smoke marijuana today, in which case you, you're aware of a lot of things that I'm not aware of around us or in the tenor of my voice and so forth. Uh, so I am talking in a much more incoherent way. Many people say, um, I would say whiskey drinking reporters often say of my talking that I'm incoherent. And I agree, because I'm talking in circles. I'm talking in cycles. I'm talking at many different levels. Uh, and uh, in the McLuhan sense, I, I don't use uh, subject predicate uh, paragraphs. Now we turn the page and go to uh, 
the next logical sequence. If you ever talk personally to Marshall McLuhan, he's a fascinating talker, in addition to being a Celt. Uh, he starts talking, and he gets right off the page and off the line, and he's talking, and he's, it's, it sounds like prose that should be written, but he's just stringing uh, these pearl beads of uh, words around, which, uh, the, oh, come on, Marshall, be logical. You're supposed to take a subject predicate, paragraph, period, change the thought. Uh -uh. Uh, life isn't that way. So I think I am more incoherent, but I also think I'm much more creative, according to my own chessboard, than I was before I took uh, psychedelic chemicals. Dr. Leary, implied in my uh, last question uh, was an underlying question. That is, all right, since man can't transcend his physiology by dropping acid, then how does one know, uh, for instance, if a particular vision or a particular experience, say, uh, isn't merely just an illusion that we need to see? An illusion what? An illusion uh, that we need to see. Pardon me. <coughs> you mean the LSD religion? Uh, well, not only the LSD religion, but other things perhaps that one might experience through uh, dropping acid, not necessarily religious things. But uh, assuming that our physiology does determine our thought models, how is it possible to know if that isn't merely another form of illusion rather than reality? Well, in the first place, I don't uh, go along with the terms illusion reality. I think everything is real. <coughs> I think Webster's Dictionary is real, and all the words in Webster's Dictionary are real. They're little wiggles of black and white. Uh, they may not have no connection with any other level of reality, <laughs> but uh, 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 my definition of reality is uh, there are an infinite number of realities which uh, are defined as different patterns of energy decoded by different structures. So I, I think that what goes on inside the nucleus of an atom is a reality. It's a reality that's invisible to us. What goes on inside your body is invisible to us. Uh, one level of reality is the symbolic mind that we were taught in college and in high school. Uh, the, uh, the glory of the situation to me is that you tune in on more of these levels and you harness them up. It's a bead game that we are playing. We're trying to be able to register and uh, incorporate and integrate and coordinate many, many different levels of reality. But it is a game. Uh, the LSD religion, which is going to be the orthodoxy in this country in 10 or 15 years, is a game. I think it's a much higher level game uh, and a much broader game and a much more harmonious uh, divine game than the one that's played out in a whiskey drinking culture. But it's still a game. And people in this room will see, within 10 or 15 years, an LFD orthodoxy. The LSD game is going to go the way of every other game. Uh, there'll be a psychedelic commission in Washington which will be passing down directives saying, uh, students are forbidden to take LSD 100 until they pass marijuana 1A. Uh, at that time, you'll realize what's happened, and you will not let that happen. You will just uh, move on. Uh, I I'm very optimistic about the evolutionary process. And I don't want you to buy this. This is my testimony of sheer romantic faith. I happen to worship uh, the DNA code as, a, as the most complex manifestation of the divine process that I can understand. Uh, I think the DNA code has been doing this for two billion years, always by the skin of its teeth. The DNA code is always down there inside the nucleus of every uh, cell, spinning out this wonder, wonderful variety that we call every form of life, vegetative, mammalian, and so forth. I think the DNA code is continually freaking itself out and surprising itself. Oh my God, we made too many of them and they're eating them up. So uh, we have to uh, balance it out. Uh, it's an incredible game when you see what the DNA code is doing. It's, it, it, it always comes through with the right solution. It's always, whew, well, we say that one. And it's always eating itself up in this incredible conversation that it's having with itself. And it is basically unified. It, it started, uh, two billion years ago, we're told. I think that, uh, that the genetic code always produces the particular molecule it needs. The language of the DNA code is, is uh, molecular. It always produces the vitamin, or it always produces the uh, particular chemical that's needed. And I think that right now, not 100 years ago, not 10 years from now in the future, but right about now, LSD is the uh, particular molecule the DNA code has thrown into our mouths uh, to deal with the sickness of our times. Because we need something like LSD to wake man up or he's going to 
really offend the genetic code. Uh, now in 10 or 15 years, LSD won't work anymore. It'll be corrupted, it'll be a game, and then the DNA code, I have complete faith, will develop, uh, open up our nervous system a little more to uh, solve the problem again. But uh, there's no illusion, it's all real. At every level of reality, at every level of energy, it's real. Uh, and one thing that disturbs the people in my profession is that, that uh, some people get turned on to one level of reality. You can get turned on to your eyeball. And like the first time you take LSD or sometimes even marijuana, you become so entranced with vision. It's all alive. It's all alive. Of course it's alive. It's a light bouncing into your retina at a speed of 186 miles. Do you think there are things out there? There's nothing but light that hits your eye. Then they become so involved with, um, with retina that uh, they build a whole system of that, mandala. The only way to find God is through mandala and through uh, training the eye and centering, or through breathing, or through mantra chanting, or through hatha yoga and posturing, or through sacred dance, or through the Bible, or through my particular, uh, through the sexual chakra, or through the heart chakra. If you study the history of my profession, you'll find that uh, at times uh, the um, psychedelic scholars have uh, said that every organ of the body is the only way to find God, and we'll kill anyone that disagrees with us. Uh, but uh, there are many levels of reality. Uh, the glory, I think, of the human situation is that we can't this time really explore this wide variety, use all of them uh, to uh, find meaning, and uh, we must be very tolerant about uh, the particular religious sacraments and energy systems that other people use to turn on with. Let, could I have one more question, please? By, by dropping out, as you want us to do or suggest that we do, aren't we really aiding and abetting the establishment by giving them a clearinghouse, clearing out the people that they don't <laughs> need or they don't want so they can carry out their plans of destruction, their monstrous ideas and plans? All right. Suppose uh, that uh, a considerable percentage of college-age and high school-age kids uh, try this experiment. Okay, we'll drop out for just six months. Just six months, uh, Daddy Bird, that's all. Can't we have six months? Is your society so brittle that you can't let uh, high school and college kids just take a breather for six months? Uh, that means, Daddy Bird, we won't be going to high school or college, so uh, I don't know what those teachers are going to do. Uh, we're not going to join the Army for six months. We're not going to fight. We're not going to picket. We're not going to do any social game just for six months with that whole shaky system slide to a halt and crumble. We won't, in the next election, everyone under 30 just won't vote. Uh, no, I'm sorry, I can't see any difference. Uh, uh, my, my cells don't respond to uh, you, Governor Brown, or to you, Ronald Reagan, sorry. Um, I'm voting it should be uh, Bob Dylan versus the Rolling Stones, maybe. Uh, Six months. Try that experiment. Six months. The the kids just uh, just surfing the beach. Uh, just, uh, just six months. You see what would happen. How can they fight a war uh, without you? Matter of fact, you know teenagers uh, uh, support the businesses. Why? What would happen to all those shiny convertibles from Detroit if the teenagers just said, "Nope, we won't ride in cars for six months." What about the oil business? Well, you know, oil politics runs the world. You know, behind LBJ is the Texas oil men. If the teenagers didn't burn up all that oil, the world would stop, wouldn't it? Uh, try it. Uh, turn on, tune in, drop out, turn on, tune in. Drop out, turn on, tune in, drop out, turn on.